Welcome to part 9 of the SCA 80Q Amplifier Kit Series. In parts 1 through 7, I unboxed the kit, tested and replaced faulty components, completed the construction, and fixed a problem that was causing distortion. In part 8, I talked about the amp's four-dimensional feature and asked friends and family what they thought about the amp's sound. Now it's your chance. In this episode, you'll get to hear the amp for yourself, and I encourage you to voice your opinion in the comments. And no, I'm not just going to record the amp playing through some speakers. First, though, let's ask this test equipment what it thinks. Tell me, test equipment, how much power does the amp produce? Oh, about 43 watts per channel into 8 ohms, with less than a half percent total harmonic distortion. That's impressive, given that the amp is only rated for 30 watts per channel. Don't speak test equipment language? No problem, allow me to interpret. Here's what's happening. The test equipment is putting a test tone into the amp's inputs. Additionally, it's connected to the amp's speaker outputs and monitoring its performance. On the display, watch as I raise the volume of the amplifier until the tone at the speaker outputs becomes distorted. Distortion is when the output signal no longer looks like the input signal, and naturally this distortion is undesirable. The test software tells me if the output is distorted using a couple of methods. First, visually using the oscilloscope. An oscilloscope gives a visual representation of frequency waves. When the waves are smooth, they're called sine waves. When they're straight, they're called square waves. The tone going into the amplifier is a sine wave, so when the output wave flattens and starts becoming a square wave, we get a visual indication of distortion. The software also has a more precise way of telling us there's distortion, and that's with this window which shows something called total harmonic distortion, or THD. I'll tell you more about harmonic distortion soon, but for now, just know that THD is a calculation of just how much the output signal has distorted from the input signal, represented as a percentage. Dynico says that at full power, THD should be less than half a percent. Distortion below 1% is difficult to hear, so this is a relatively low amount. Now, we're only interested in the power that the amp can produce without distortion, so I'll now reduce the amp's volume until there's a smooth-looking sine wave and distortion is below the rated 0.5%. At this volume, the software tells us that the output voltage is about 1.8 volts AC. The real voltage is actually 10 times that, though, and here's why. To connect the computer and software to the amp, a DAC or DAC interface is required. DAC stands for Digital to Analog Converter, and the Spectra DAC 2000 I'm using can only handle an input of up to 10 volts. Many amps produce more than 10 volts though, so I use this voltage attenuator to reduce the voltage by a factor of 10. So when the software shows 1.8 volts, the actual voltage coming out of the amp is 18.5 volts. And this is our starting point to calculate the amp's output power in watts. The formula for watts is voltage squared divided by the resistance. The resistance is simply the value of the load created by the speakers. Dynico specifies the amp's power with an 8 ohm load, so naturally I tested the amp with 8 ohm speakers connected, right? No, wrong. Using speakers when testing amps not only creates unbearably loud sound levels, it also puts the speakers at risk. That's because the speakers may not be able to handle the power and distortion created during testing. So instead of using speakers for amp testing, we instead trick the amp into thinking that speakers are actually connected using something called a dummy load. A dummy load is simply a resistor which provides the necessary load. Here are two dummy load resistors I own. Both provide an 8 ohm resistance, but the small one can only handle up to 90 watts, while the large one can handle up to 300. When using a dummy load, it's important that it can handle the wattage that you'll be testing. For the test in this video though, I'm not using any of those resistors. Instead, I'm using my Sencor amplifier analyzer with its adjustable dummy load set to 8 ohms. So now that we know the maximum output voltage of the amp while staying below a half percent distortion is about 18.5 volts and that the load is 8 ohms, we can compute the maximum wattage output of the amp, which is about 43 watts per channel. Why would anybody want to know this? Well, the more clean power an amp can provide, the louder it can play without distortion. This is important if you have inefficient speakers that require more power, have a larger room to fill, or want to listen at loud levels. For more on this topic, please see my other video, Build a Vintage Stereo, Components, and Things Every Stereo Buyer Should Know. I'll leave a link in the description. We now know that at maximum power, the amp has about half percent total harmonic distortion at 1 kHz. But what about at the other frequencies? This test computes THD plus noise over the full audio band, and at the rated output of 30 watts per channel, shows that at the very low frequency of 30 hertz, distortion and noise are at about 0.1%, at the mid frequency of 2 kHz, about 0.2%, and at the very high frequency of 20 kHz, only about 0.02%. 
So now you might be thinking, Flux, that means nothing to me. What exactly is harmonic distortion? Well, let me show you using our next test, which reveals how much distortion there is with multiple tones playing. This is called intermodulation distortion, or IMD for short. Typically, this test is done with two frequencies, one at 60 hertz, the other at 7 kilohertz, and with an amplitude ratio of 4 to 1, meaning that the 60 hertz signal is four times greater in level than the 7 kilohertz signal. Dynaco says a properly performing SCA80Q should have IMD that's less than 0.1%, and at rated power, we see that the amp is coming in just below that. Now I think I can hear you saying fine flex, but I just want to know what harmonic distortion is. Well, it's actually right there in front of you. Let me explain. Original signals are called the fundamental frequencies. Here you can see the fundamentals are the input frequencies at 60 hertz and 7 kilohertz. In a perfect amplifier, that's all you'd see. But notice all these other bumps. These are the harmonics or non-fundamental frequencies. Harmonics naturally get generated from the process of amplification. And in fact, all instruments create harmonics using their forms of amplification. And it's why a guitar sounds different than a piano, even when playing the exact same note. And while it's great that instruments create harmonics, we don't want that from our stereos. We want to hear how the music actually sounds, not distorted artifacts. And that's why audio equipment is designed to keep harmonics to a minimum. Unfortunately, all audio equipment, no matter how good, adds harmonic distortion. Our SCA80Q is a good performer with harmonics mostly about 60 dBs below the signal, which makes those harmonics barely audible. Better equipment will have lower harmonic distortion, but the degree to which this makes an audible difference is really up for debate, as with everything in hi-fi. Speaking of hi-fi, what does that mean exactly? Well, it stands for high fidelity, and the term became popular in the 50s to describe equipment that could reproduce all or most of the audible frequencies with noise and distortion that's basically inaudible. Sometimes people will use the term incorrectly, referring to mid-level equipment as mid-fi. Beware of anyone who uses that term, as it usually reveals more about a person's snobbery than the actual performance of the equipment. In fact, here's a dirty secret few will admit. Most good amps, regardless of cost or marketing BS, sound about the same. When put to the test, the majority of people, even experts, would not be able to hear the difference between this 30-year-old Kenwood and this new Macintosh. Both provide 100 watts per channel, but the Kenwood is a mid-level unit that can be had for about $100 or less, and the Macintosh sells for over $5,000. So my point is, high fidelity has been fairly easy to achieve since the 50s, and our modest 1970s Dynaco amp is definitely up to the task. Our tests show that distortion and noise are in the realm of hi-fi, and so does this test. It shows the amp's frequency response, and we can see that it can easily reproduce the full audible spectrum from 20 Hz to 20,000 Hz with barely any deviation. Getting back to distortion again, the THD plus noise test I showed earlier displayed harmonics and noise as a percentage, but here we see it stated as a ratio between the signal and noise. This is called the signal to noise ratio. And at the rate of 30 watts output in our amp, it's about 58 dBs on the left channel and 57 dBs on the right. This means that the noise is almost 60 dBs below the signal. Not the absolute best performance for an amp, but still barely audible. We can also visualize the noise in harmonics with the spectrum analyzer. Notice on the left, I have markers at 60 and 120 hertz. This is ripple noise from the AC power supply that's making its way through the filter capacitors. Again, at that level, it's still barely audible. In the center is the 1 kilohertz fundamental frequency, and to the right, the harmonics. These are marked as the second, third, fourth, and fifth harmonics. One fascinating curiosity of harmonics is that while all harmonics are a form of distortion, even-numbered harmonics sometimes sound warm and pleasing, while odd-numbered harmonics tend to sound harsh. This has led to a lot of common unsense out there that says that solid-state amps, meaning those that use diodes and transistors instead of tubes, create excessive harsh odd harmonics, while supposedly superior tube amps create more pleasing even harmonics. This is just untrue. We can see here that even the SCA80Q, an early transistor design that goes back to the late 60s, does not produce excessive odd harmonics. Okay, moving on. Now let's test the amp's phono stage. An amplifier's phono stage is different than those used for a CD or tape player. 
For one, it needs to amplify the signal even more at the preamp stage because the voltages coming from a phono cartridge are much lower than those from most other types of equipment. And the phono section needs to re-equalize the input signals to compensate for the RIAA curve. You can also learn more about this in the video I recommended earlier. Again, link in the description. To test the phono stage, I use this analog production's test record. Here we see there's a flat response from 1 kHz to 20 Hz, good. But with the 1 kHz to 20 kHz test, there is a slight dip in the level at about 18 kHz. I'm not entirely sure what's going on here, but I think this is due to an impedance mismatch and the fact that I was too lazy to replace the moving coil cartridge I had in the turntable with a more suitable moving magnet cartridge. Like most mid-level integrated amps, the SCA80Q doesn't really have the necessary gain for a moving coil cartridge, so this is an incomplete test. Still, it shows there are no real issues with the phono stage, and honestly, even with the wrong type of cartridge, records played through the amp sounded absolutely great. So we discussed the concept of high fidelity, but you can actually have hi-fi without stereo, and stereo without hi-fi. Like almost all integrated amplifiers, the SCA80Q is capable of not only hi-fi, but also stereo. And that, of course, means it has separate channels for the left and right inputs and speakers. Actually, it has separate channels for rear speakers as well, which I talked about in the previous episode. You might think it's simple for a stereo amp to separate the left and right channels, and that you couldn't possibly hear the left signal in the right channel, and vice versa. But the truth is, unless the amp is a true dual mono design, which most aren't, there's always going to be some blending. And the degree to which the channels blend is called channel separation. Dynaco says that channel separation should be 50 dB or more from 20 Hz to 10 kHz. This means that from the very low frequencies of 20 Hz to the very high frequencies of 10 kHz, the level you'll hear the left signal in the right and the right signal in the left should be 50 dB lower than the intended signal. At 50 dB, this blending or crosstalk is sometimes noticeable, but barely. Better equipment would provide better channel separation, which theoretically could enhance stereo imaging. But once again, after a certain point, the degree to which this makes an audible difference is up for debate. To put the amp's channel separation to the test, I first did a frequency sweep with just a left signal input, and then with just a right signal input. I found the channel separation was actually between 60 and 20 dBs from 20 Hz to 10 kHz, with better separation at lower frequencies. That's okay, but not as good as claimed, and Lady Dynaco warned me about this in a previous episode. Position the twisted groups of wires from the selector switch as shown in the photograph below. In particular, the groups from the rear wafer should be separated from the front wafer groups to preserve maximum channel separation. I actually think I did do a good job keeping wiring separate, but given that the amp uses a lot of wires with limited shielding, a uh, design of this type will never really have the best channel separation. Now let's get back to the waves. Earlier, I explained the difference between sine waves and square waves, and music is usually made of sine waves, except for, you know, some types of synthesized electronic instruments, but the ability of an amp to output a square wave can reveal how well it actually performs. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but Dynaco actually makes note of this in the manual, showing what square wave output should look like on an oscilloscope at different frequencies. Let's compare those to my results. Not bad, and I see no issues. Okay, so in the last episode, my friends and family said that they thought the amp sounds good. I think it sounds good. The test equipment says it's pretty good. But what do you think? In the following sequence, you'll hear the sound of the amp recorded directly from its speaker outputs. This was done using a voltage divider to reduce the output to a level suitable for recording. Every 10 seconds, the sequence will switch from the recording of the amp's inputs to a recording of the amp's outputs. This will allow you to hear the differences imparted to the sound by the amp. Now, of course, as you're listening through YouTube, the sound quality will be somewhat limited by compression. Still, I find YouTube's sound quality is more than good enough for a comparison such as this. Please let me know how you think the amp sounds in the comments. Here we go.
Looking for a shiny new gadget for your bench? Some good books on electronics, vintage hi-fi or old radios? Indispensable tools, cleaners or other products? Check out my new Amazon shop and help the channel. Lots of great products I actually own, use and recommend. Plus my thoughts on each one. Link in the description. To stay updated, please subscribe to my channel and click the bell to receive notifications when I release new videos. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. I'll see you soon.